25 years old. He's believed to be five feet, six inches tall, weighing around 200 pounds with a medium build. Now, police say the incident happened on Saturday, August 14th at around six o'clock in the morning. It happened in the 2400 block of Chester Avenue. Anyone with information is being asked to call the Bakersfield Police Department. A Black Lives Matter activist is suing the LAPD after they responded to a call at her home about a hostage situation that may have been a swatting incident. ABC's Leslie Marin has the story. Just showed up. We were supposed to be at a press conference. Black Lives Matter LA co-founder Melina Abdullah recorded this Instagram video last August when LAPD officers showed up to her home after they say they got a 911 call about a hostage situation there. Okay, we got a call to this location that there's a male in there holding you guys hostage and he wants a million dollars or he's going to kill you within an hour. Oh my, no, somebody that's a, there's nobody in the house except my own security. Because of that, we just want to make sure that you're okay. I'm fine. Okay. My kids are petrified. Police later learned the call may have been a swatting incident when a person falsely reports a crime to garner police response. But Abdullah is now suing LAPD over their actions that day. It was not accidental. They were not coming to quote unquote keep me safe. They were coming to invoke terror. They were coming to terrorize. In the lawsuit, Abdullah claims police never made contact with her before more than 20 officers surrounded her home in tactical gear. Now, does LAPD call the landline of that home? No. Does LAPD call Dr. Molina's cell phone? No. Does LAPD take any measures to ensure that the call is not a hoax? No. Abdullah believes the large response was retribution for leading massive protests throughout L.A. in the days following the murder of George Floyd. The union that represents LAPD officers told us in a statement officers acted swiftly and professionally, saying in part, we have no doubt that if LAPD officers would have been delayed in their response or did not take the threat to kill hostages seriously, Ms. Abdullah would be suing the city for not providing an adequate police response. And that was Leslie Marine reporting. California is the first state to ban large retailers from firing warehouse workers for not working enough hours because they were taking rest or bathroom breaks instead. Assembly Bill 701 that Governor Gavin Newsom signed into law stemmed from how Amazon was overworking their staff to deliver items to consumers more quickly. The measure also bans Amazon and other retailers from getting in trouble for following health and safety guidelines and lets them retaliate if harmful quotas are imposed. Workers who, workers who think their quotas lead to unsafe behavior can ask for 90 days worth of documentation on how their work speed meets or fails that quota. Any discipline within that 90 days is presumed to be retaliation. Well, coming up on 23BC News at 5, the manhunt to find Brian Laundry is ramping up in Florida. And we will tell you how the Gabby Petito case is helping in the search for other people who have gone missing. That and much more still to come. It's 5-11. We're just getting started this morning. You're watching 23 ABC. Welcome back. The manhunt to find Brian Laundrie is ramping up in Florida's Carlton Nature Reserve. The FBI is asking for the public's help in finding Laundrie, who has eluded authorities since returning to Florida, without Gabby Petito on September 1st. Commander Joe Fussell says law enforcement is attempting to cover every acre in that nature preserve. We've deployed numerous resources and we are trying to cover every acre in this preserve. These guys are law enforcement partners. They're motivated and they're hungry to find Brian Landry. They're ambitious to partner with us. Um, so working with them has been great and we really um, appreciate the partnership that we have with them. Well, there's also a new tip about his movements before he returned to Florida. One woman says on TikTok, she and her boyfriend gave Laundry a ride August 29th in Wyoming. She said he claimed he was camping by himself for several days while Petito was back at their van working on social media posts. Miranda Baker said they picked up Laundry while he was hitchhiking not far from where Petito's remains were later found. And as that search continues, a memorial at the final place Gabby Petito posted on Instagram is now growing. I felt that we could 
you know, pay some respect and some love to her family and to her, of course. The memorial is outside the popular Monarch mural in Ogden, Utah. And the Gabby Petito case is helping to ignite new interest in finding other missing persons. Her disappearance mobilizing an army of online sleuths now turning their skills to other unsolved cases, finally getting the attention they deserve. ABC's TJ Holmes has more. Her story has dominated news headlines and mobilized a legion of social media users. Hashtag find Gabby Petito gaining over 700 million views on TikTok. Um, I'm hoping this can help someone identify him. Many of them now internet sleuths, exchanging theories as well as sharing info about possible sightings and clues. Psychologically, people just felt very close to her because of social media. But here's the despairing truth. Gabby Petito is one of so many reported missing each year. At the end of 2020, the FBI had over 89,000 active missing persons cases. 45% of those cases, people of color. Petito's story has renewed debate about which cases get attention and the media's seeming infatuation with missing white women. But her case also sparked a call to action to bring others home, like Daniel Robinson, a 24-year-old geologist who went missing in the desert outside Buckeye, Arizona in late June. His Jeep was found mangled July 19th, about four miles from where he was last seen. The Buckeye Police Department says in a statement, investigators are utilizing every resource possible to locate him, including assistance from partner agencies and information provided by the public. His family has also organized searches in the desert heat. I thank God for all the volunteers who left their houses every morning uh, in the mornings and, and spent out, um, time out there in the desert. There's also Maya Miliete and Jelani Day. Miliette, a mother of three, has been missing for over nine months. The 39-year-old was last seen at her family home in Chula Vista, California. Day, a 25-year-old graduate student at Illinois State University, was last seen August 24th in Bloomington, Illinois. His car was discovered two days later, but no signs of Day. Jelani is, um, he's a sweetheart. I shouldn't have to beg. I shouldn't have to plead. I shouldn't have to feel that <laughs> there is a racial disparity. I shouldn't have to feel any about that. I want these people that have these resources to realize this could, this could happen to them. And that was ABC's TJ Holmes reporting. In other news, Paul Flores will stand trial in the Kristen Smart murder case. A judge ruling the case can proceed to a jury trial after a marathon preliminary hearing lasting more than seven weeks. Nearly three dozen witnesses were questioned on the witness stand. Flores is charged with the 1996 murder of Cal Poly student Kristen Smart. A judge ruling the prosecution has presented enough evidence to hold Flores accountable to murder charges. Flores' father, Ruben Flores, is charged with helping to cover up the crime. The Justice Department is trying to block a deal between American Airlines and JetBlue. American Airlines CEO says the deal is not a merger, but rather allows the two airlines to work together. The Justice Department, though, claims that the partnership will reduce competition and lead to higher prices. The department and officials in six states have filed a lawsuit to block the deal. The two airlines plan to fight the suit. You know, obviously, I was just on an airplane. Yes. It is so strange traveling right now. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember the last time I was on a plane. What, what was it like? Just a little claustrophobic? It, I was, it was a little anxiety yeah. provoking because yeah. I ha on the way there, on the way back, I will say I did feel more comfortable. Because you were coming back to Bakersfield. And the heat, I am so glad to be back in the, the nice warm and the weather. Heat, yeah. No, we had some 100s while you were gone. I was thinking about you all day. I'm like, oh, it's like 50 where she is at home in Canada right now. And yesterday got up to 99. But you see those passing clouds we had over the last six hours. A little bit of a wind event coming through. Just a passing trough. Pushed a lot of our smoke into eastern Kern County. Sorry, Isabella and Ridgecrest. We gave you everything that we had. And now as those winds calm down, the smoke comes right back in. So obviously it's our proximity to these major 
wildfires, the windy fire, the Campy complex that are putting all of that smoke into the region, impacting Isabella more than anybody, but it's really coming down toward Ridgecrest and then it fills into our bowl here and it gets stuck. So we did like pushing a lot of it out overnight and getting those cooler temperatures, but we're right back to the smoky, sunny heat later today. So from 99 for your Wednesday to 93 on this Thursday, it's still above average, but at least it's falling several degrees, even if we have to deal with the bad air quality as a result. Isabella and the Ridgecrest area also in those 90s with all of that smoke. Tatchby, Fraser Park, some mid 80s for you. And that's just that system that dug in. So with that kind of off to our east, we're going to push it out of the way, start warming things back up under high pressure Friday into Saturday. But we still can have some action to the south, so I'm not really calling for a chance of rain. See how it's getting just by us late Saturday into Sunday, but the high pressure still in control. So we've been watching this future cast because it keeps changing. Each model run is different, but I still don't see any promising good chances of rain here in Kern County. And we actually kind of like that for the weekend ahead, even though it would bring temperatures down and provide us some much needed rain and better air quality. When it's down to our south like this and it's combined with the heat and the instability, it can create thunderstorms. And the last thing we need in our local mountains, right, is more lightning strikes. So we'll continue to watch that because everything starts getting pushed out of the way Monday. Temperatures will be down a few degrees. Tuesday, the winds kick up, and that's all because of this system here. It's well to our north, so we're not getting really any rain chances out of this for now. But we do get that fresh westerly wind, and look at how it'll take us out of those hazy 90s this weekend to the upper 80s, which is seasonal on Monday, low 80s Tuesday, and the potential to see some 70s for our highs next Wednesday. Again, only a slight chance of rain this far south, but passing clouds, breezes, better air quality, better temperatures, feeling like fall for the end of September. <sighs> We're ready, right? It's been more than three months since we've seen highs in the 70s. And October does begin next Friday, which is actually kind of a false fall for us because those Santa Ana winds get us hot yet again. Isabella, 90s for you through the weekend with the smoke, unfortunately, attached to be Fraser Park 80s. But you are all looking ahead to 70s. Even the South Mountains could see some 60s next week. Thanks, Elena. And coming up on 23 ABC News, veterans suffering from PTSD are getting a new sense of security how they're getting the help that they need. Plus, a boy and his puppy's similarities are bringing them closer together. Who's your group? Yes. We're coming right back. Well, here at 23ABC, we are always on the lookout for those positive stories in communities across the country. An organization in New York is helping veterans suffering from PTSD by introducing them to a furry companion. <laughs> the nonprofit Operation at Ease helps veterans train their own service dog. The Office of Veterans Affairs says that around 11 to 20 percent of vets who served in Iraq or Afghanistan suffer from PTSD. Robert Odell served in the Army for 13 years. He has been working with Benny for about six months now. He now has a sense of companionship that he says he didn't have before. Little things he does, like I used to have to close my bedroom door and lock it shut, like otherwise I'd be looking at the bedroom door all night, you know, but with him laying in bed with me and having an extra sense of security, knowing that he'll hear things before I do. Odell was concerned that having a dog would only draw more attention to him, but he says that Benny brings a new sense of calm, uh, one that some veterans have waited for.